Oh, cleaning the bath is so boring. I've actually got a heaps better way. I'm gonna show you how to make a bristle bot. To make a bristle bot, you're gonna need some brushes. You can use a toothbrush, a toilet brush. I'm gonna use a scrubbing brush. And if you use a toilet brush, make sure you get a new one first. You'll also need a hot glue gun, scissors, cable ties, a battery pack and motor. You can get these from any electronics stores or salvage them from old toys. And some decorations, pipe cleaners, googly eyes, some pom-poms, and you'll also need some brushes. Let's get to work. First step, choose your brush. I'm gonna use the scrubbing brush, but you can use all different kinds. And if they've got a long handle, make sure you get your parents to help you cut it off. And now we're gonna attach the batteries to the motor. We wanna grab the motor, and then with the two cords from the battery pack, just loop the ends through the connections on the motor and give it a twist. And that's gonna hold it into place. And the other one. So the red and black wire are positive and negative. So the red is positive and the black is negative. And on this motor, it doesn't matter which side you use. Next, grab a cable tie and we're gonna stick that on the motor and it's gonna help us vibrate our bristle bot. Just pop the cable tie over the end of the motor and then stick it there with a little bit of hot glue. Always be careful because it's hot. And now with the scissors, carefully cut the cable tie down to make it shorter so it can spin. So again, with the hot glue, just put a little bit on the bottom of the motor and then we're just gonna stick it down in the center of the scrubbing brush. The good thing about hot glue guns is it dries really quickly. And a bit more just to keep it in place. And now for the battery pack, Gonna stick that behind there, a little bit on top. And now the motor's in place, it's time to decorate our bristle bot and give it some character. Let's give our bristle bot some eyes. So dob in the centre and carefully just gonna stick them to the front there. And same on the other side. I've also got these cool hands, so I'll put these on. Same again, hot glue. That's coming together, but I think he needs a cool hairstyle. Grab a pom-pom. And a bit of hot glue. And now our bristle bot's done, it's time to switch it on and release it into the wild. Next time mum asks me to clean the bathroom, I'm gonna get my scrubbing brush robot to do it for me. Good as new. I consider myself to be a bit of an athlete. And seeming I'm in Melbourne, I'd be stupid to not come and check out the Australian Open. Free VIP pass? Let's see what we can find. The Australian Open is a yearly tennis tournament held in Melbourne. And Paige has stumbled upon the secret headquarters of the Ball Kids, whose job it is to supply and retrieve tennis balls for the professional players during matches. They hold a daily meeting right here. My name is Finn Lee and I'm a Ball Kid at the Australian Open and I'm 13 years old. Uh, there's around 6,500 kids from Korea and Australia that applied to be in the squad. Yeah, out of 6,000 kids, it's cut down all the way to 300 kids, so it's a very brutal process. Um, you don't have to be a tennis player to be a ball kid, and, which makes it really good, because as long as you know what to do on court, what the scores are, you can pretty much, yeah, anyone can be a ball kid. You can work on those skills as the program goes on, but yeah, you do have to know how to catch a ball and how to roll a ball. I've never had a ball hit me yet, so that's good, but it may happen in the future and just need to watch out. I've fallen over before uh, on court, tripped over my shoe, wasn't a great day, but 
I managed to get through my shoes, which we did at the time, so we've got some new ones, we've got some spray ones. I'm Sophie and I'm a ball kid at the 2018 Australian Open and I'm 12 years old. I went through a series of free trials and um, just trained a lot with my sister and then made it to the training squad and trained for five months and yeah, made it through, which I'm pretty happy about. The games can go for a really long time, but the way I keep focused is just remember that this is one of my passions and I really love tennis, so just keep watching. Uh, my favourite thing about being a bookie would have to be getting up close to the players and really being in the atmosphere of it all and making new friends. Paige decided she was all over this ball kid gig. Let's see how she went. Ah, uh, not so good. Oh, guys, I think I need a bit of help. Yeah, you really do. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing is to get down low when you're rolling mm -hmm. and the speed. You gotta have a really big wind up and follow through with your arm. Like that? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Should we go practice? Yeah, yeah let's go. Yep, sometimes you've just got to leave it to the professionals. But that'll give you more time to work on that winning serve. I'm Lachlan Manning, a spider angler here at the Australian Museum, and we're about to milk a spider. So, I am sure you're all here to see a spider have some venom extracted from it. Here is our banded huntsman spider. And what we need to do to actually get a little bit of venom out of this spider, we need to put it to sleep. Whoop. He's in, he's away. And we're going to connect him up to this gas cylinder here. So this is full of carbon dioxide gas. And what's happening here is as I turn this gas on, the gas is going to go through this hose here into this container. It's going to push out all the oxygen. Because of the lack of oxygen, it's going to trigger a really important survival technique in this spider. It will go into this sleep mode called diapause or torpor. Gas is off. So I've got to move quickly because now there's more oxygen out here and it's quite warm out here, especially under this lamp. And the spider's blood temperature is the same temperature of the air around it. The spider's blood's going to warm up quite quickly. It's going to pick up a lot more oxygen. So I've got, I've got about 10 minutes before this spider truly wakes up. Now what I need to do is gently turn him on his back. I'm going to use these pins just around the sides of the body to hold the spider in place. The venom comes out of the fangs, so we need to get the fangs into a little tube, like this pipette tip. Popped it into that pipette tip. Now I'm getting these electrostimulators, which will give me a 12 volt current. When applied around the muscles surrounding the venom gland, okay. And this spider is done. Just gently move the pins out of the way and as you can see, it's just waking up. There you go. Up you get. Good boy. Now he's all done. So you go in there. Right. And that spider has earned itself a well break. Going to take a pipette tip here. Hopefully, with a little bit of venom, going to draw up a bit of water into that pet tip. So any venom in there is now mixed up with that water. And I'm going to push it all out into a clean tube. To preserve this venom, we're going to dry it out. So all the liquids will be taken out by this vacuum concentrator here. This wheel here will spin around for two hours. The basin here will heat up 
all air will be sucked out there. So as that basin heats up, the water will evaporate. The water, vapor, the water vapor will be sucked out with the air into that vacuum. Because the protein, the molecules of the venom is so strong, it's going to stay in the bottom of that valve and push down by that centrifuge. Anything will be collected up in the bottom of these valves or dried up and ready to go off to the University of Queensland and potentially become the inspiration for a new type of medicine or a new type of pesticide. So I hope you enjoyed that and have a great day. Humans aren't the only ones with amazing noses. Here are some snouts, nostrils and trunks you might not have thought about. Elephants have more genes for smell than any other animal. Bears can smell food, even buried underground, from nearly 30 kilometres away. Salmon imprint the smells of the rivers they are born in and use this to find their way back home later in life. Sharks can pick up the scent of a drop of blood from hundreds of kilometres away. This is like detecting a teaspoon of tuna fish oil in a swimming pool. Two thirds of the shark's brain weight are devoted to smell and their nostrils are used entirely for smelling and not for breathing. Snakes use their tongues to catch the scent molecules in the air. The structure of their forked tongue allows the snake to pick up the direction of the scent as well. <laughs> Studies of the brain of the Tyrannosaurus shows it had a very good sense of smell. Perfect for sniffing out its prey. Now that's clever. Paige might be a professional surfer, but she's definitely not a professional server. This is where the Hawkeye technology comes into play. It helps tennis players improve their game. My name is Dr Marka Reid. I'm the Head of Innovation for Tennis Australia. What that means is I look for new, cool ways to try and make sure that players and coaches can get the best out of their games and their coaching. So all of you will have seen Hawkeye on the TV screens when watching tennis at home. That helps us to determine whether the ball's in or out. We don't use it for that reason. We've got a special court here at the National Tennis Centre which has 10 cameras taking 50 frames per second that allows us to track what the player's doing and the ball to make sure the players can hit the ball as well as they possibly can. So one of the beauties of the Hawkeye technology is how precise it is. There's about a 0.5 centimetre error. So, could it be better? Absolutely. But when you're making decisions about your game, that level of precision is really important. So one of the beauties of Hawkeye is that it allows us to compare a player's game to the best players in the world. So we can look at the serve, we can look at the forehand, we can look at the backhand compare speeds to what the game's best do. So, with that in mind, let's have a look at Paige's serve and see how that stacks up. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Paige, great effort. Thank let's you. Get into the racket room and check out our stats. Let's do it. All right, let's how have, did I do? Let's have a look. So here's our Hawkeye technology. Paige, what we see first and foremost is a lot of variety here with the ball toss. <laughs> so when you've got that much variability in your ball toss, it makes it really difficult to control the outcome of your serve. Good news though, we had one land in the target <laughs> area. In terms of numbers, your speed here, and we can see it, that's what the Hawkeye technology provides us with, 51 kilometres an hour. Ooh. Okay, so reasonable starting point. If we compare that to the top female players in the world, the top 10, they serve at 151 kilometres an hour. So we've got a little bit of work to do. Okay, need a bit more practice.
All right, so I might not be the best server. And when it comes to being a ball kid, don't quite make the grade. But with a little bit of practice and some help from the sports scientist, I think I'll be back here next year versing the champs. Hi, my name's Andrew Stocker. I work at the La Trobe Wildlife Sanctuary on La Trobe University's Bundura campus in Melbourne. And I'm a nature nurturer or a conservationist. A conservationist is a person that actually cares a lot about the environment, what we do to the environment, and actually tries to uh, minimise their impact um, on, on the environment around them. I've been studying for a, a long time. I've done a course in ecotourism, I've done a course in electronic engineering, and the last qualification that I have is actually a Masters of Teaching. So the Latrobe Wildlife Sanctuary is really special because it's one of the oldest conservation projects in Australia. We've been here for probably about 50 years. Before we started turning this into a wildlife sanctuary, it used to be farm paddocks and recreation facilities for the local hospital. Over the last 50 years, we've actually done a lot of work in removing the pest species from the wildlife sanctuary, so that's the plants, the weeds, and animals like foxes and cats and dogs, and then trying to put back in what we call the indigenous plants and animals. Hmm, ironbarks or wetland? I think we'll head to the wetland. So this tree is really exciting because it's actually um, different to a eucalyptus tree. This is an acacia um, and these are actually called phyllodes. Uh, they're not technically leaves. And wow, there's this bug on here that I've never seen before. And here's the wetland. So I've actually always been pretty good at science. I've spent a lot of time asking questions, which is why I think those sorts of people make good scientists. So as a conservationist or nature nurturer, I actually get to go out into the bush and teach other people about my passion about protecting the environment. An ecosystem is all the living and the non-living things like weather and temperature, as well as plants and animals that make up a system that sort of interacts together um, to produce sort of healthy systems. We do all sorts of things on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes we go out and we actually record the different sorts of animals and plants that we find in the ecosystems. We also actually wander around and we do things like counting birds. Sometimes we do nighttime things where we look at the trees and see what sort of animals emerge at night. My favourite plant in the wildlife sanctuary is the chocolate lily. It's a really awesome plant, it's so tiny, but every summer it shoots up this massive purple flower. And if you smell these flowers, oh, it smells like chocolate. So my favourite animal is the echidna. I really love them because they're a monotreme. They are an egg-laying mammal, and there's only three of those in the world. We've got the echidna, the platypus in Australia, and there's another type of echidna that's actually in Fiji, I think. So this is a massive river red gum tree. It's about 400 to 500 years old. These guys live somewhere between 800 and 1,000 years. So the coolest thing about my job is actually getting out and about and exploring and learning about nature. Probably the worst thing about my job is um, sitting in an office. I took on this job because I love being outdoors. So sitting out in front of a computer isn't really me. The proudest moment that I've had in a wildlife sanctuary is when a grade six students actually did some really cool maths in one of our experiences. And he was a student that really struggled with maths and so he was able to sort of apply some really cool maths without even knowing it. So I'd like you all to get really excited about your local conservation projects. There's loads of spaces that are being protected for future generations and I'd like to see more of them.